Welcome to the Kintsugi Hope podcast. It's great to have you with us. We are joined by some amazing speakers and experts who have experienced, like all of us, life's ups and downs. If you want to find out more about Kintsugi Hope, then please do head to the website kintsugihope.com. Hello and welcome to the Kintsugi Hope podcast. We are really excited to be here and we're really excited that Natalie Williams, who is the CEO of Jubilee Plus and the author of several books, including her most recent um, Invisible Divides, is here to talk to us all things about mental health and poverty and class um, and how those things kind of work together or don't, I guess, is 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 the question that we're going to be exploring a little bit today. Natalie, um, welcome and thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. You are more than more than welcome. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself, um, kind of where are you from? How did you get into, into ministry, into, um, into leading Jubilee Plus? Yeah, sure. So I'm uh, from Hastings on the southeast coast. I grew up in relative poverty and in a really working class family and got saved when I was 15. Uh, so started going to church because I liked the boy. Wasn't on a great spiritual quest, but uh, was looking for a boy, but ended up with Jesus, which has been better. Um, uh, yeah, so I'm happy with the way that panned out. And then um, I would say a lot of my early Christian life was very volatile, very up and down, a bit all over the place. I think I was often one foot in, one foot out. Although I genuinely had encountered Jesus, I really struggled to fit in with church. I, Struggled with mental health issues. Uh, from a, I'm from a really kind of dysfunctional background, and so yeah, kind of first ten years all a bit rocky. But then, just I guess, really pursued Jesus with my whole heart from probably my mid twenties onwards, and have always cared about the church having an impact on the community around us, and particularly the poorest, and that the church being a blessing where it exists to the people literally in its immediate surroundings and so uh for me like feeling frustrated i guess sometimes when the church hasn't done that or when organizations like the council and the police and that are struggling with certain issues in the community and don't even think the church might have anything to say yeah. so it kind of came from that place a passion for the church being all the church should be that i got involved in jubilee plus and particularly in trying to help churches change the lives of people in poverty in their communities um, and people on low incomes. And so, yeah, I got involved in Jubilee Plus the year it started in 2010, originally just editing blogs for Martin Charlesworth, who was the founder. And then two years ago, he asked me if I wanted to lead the team, which was partly, to be honest, a bit of a prophetic statement of handing it to someone with my sort of background. Yeah. Um, was was kind of a big big thing kind of i disqualified myself on several notes uh some to do with my background some to do with mental health some to do with being single um but actually he said to me you wouldn't disqualify anyone else on those grounds and you would be so angry with me if i tried to and i was like oh yeah you're right so yeah that's how i've ended up leaving jubilee plus today amazing and it's it's so true isn't it that we disqualify ourselves on all manner of things that we would not dream of disqualifying anyone else for. Um, and I think, yeah, it's something that God's been speaking to me a lot about lately as well. And I think it's it's a really important thing to, to, to hold in mind that actually we can't disqualify ourselves for anything that God doesn't disqualify ourselves for. Um, and I, I guess I kind of initially came across you when I read uh, your book Invisible Divides and um, which came out last year I think um, yeah about a year ago yeah and this idea about kind of class and church I think is is a really important issue and one of the things that you wrote in that was that actually how much of of church culture is actually just middle class culture and I it was something I'd never considered before until, and then I was like, oh yeah, actually that's a real, that's a real thing. And, and if our, our churches are going to be safe and supportive spaces, they need to be safe and supportive spaces for everybody of, of every class. And how do we do that? So can you tell us a bit about, about why you wrote Invisible Divides and, and kind of how you think that, I guess the church can cross those invisible divides of, of class that sometimes we don't even want to think about? 
Yeah, so I mean, I wrote it because I think I spent so much of my early Christian life feeling like I didn't fit in it in church at all, just because of class barriers, really. And it wasn't that anyone um, was deliberately putting up those barriers, but I think that was the whole point. They were invisible. People didn't realise they were happening. So even things like people inviting me to their home for dinner, which was designed, of course, to make me feel like I was welcomed and belonged, actually really alienated me because I'd never seen food served the way that it was served. I'd never seen my parents going around to their friends' houses for dinner at 7.30 on a weekday evening, Christian o'clock. Um, you know, I just hadn't... That it was just totally new behaviour to me. And it wasn't just about food and hospitality. It was also about the way people talked about money and possessions and home ownership and holidays and the way we talked about authority or even how to do community or even the fact that the ch my allegiance should then be to the church more than to any other community, which just these were all things that I found just deeply challenging. Um, but also I think I offended people because I was just really blunt and honest and I wasn't trying to be rude I just I'd grown up being told if someone asks you a question you just give them an honest answer and you don't yeah. sugarcoat it and you don't worry too much about whether you're being polite or what have you and so for me there was a real clash of class cultures when I became a Christian that meant though I'd come to know Jesus and had quite a, a powerful encounter with him really quite a radical encounter with him I just struggled in church and so I wanted to write Invisible Divides because I think if we don't know the barriers are there, we can't do anything about them. So the whole point of the book is to, first of all, shine a spotlight on some of the things that alienate or exclude or even offend people from a working class background from churches where the majority are middle class. But not to stop there, but to also suggest some ways in which we can cross those divides both on both sides, um, you know, in both directions. And so, yeah, that's... We, you know, Paul Brown and I wrote the book together. Uh, he's from a working class background, but it's, I think it's really important that there's a male voice and a female voice. And our experience is actually quite different, but with some common themes and threads that we've tried to bring out through the book. Yeah. And I think, how do you think we can be more, both, both more aware, but also more inclusive across those class divides in a way that, I guess my... My question is, is how do how do we cross those divides without making such a big deal of it that they, they feel like kind of impossible to, to cross, if that makes sense? Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think, first of all, just to say that in national research by the British Social Attitude Survey, the working classes already think there is a massive divide. So and it was really interesting right in the book and since the book came out. The only hand on heart, the only people who have said you're making too big a deal out of this or you're you're making you're shining a spotlight on something that doesn't need to be exposed. Like almost like you're making it worse by doing that. Hand on heart, the only people who've said that are middle class people. Yeah. Everyone who's got in touch with us from a working class background has just been relieved that someone's written about it or relieved they're not the only one. Or I've had people and people who are really in high power jobs suddenly go, oh, do you know what? I suddenly understand why I feel so out of place, both in my professional life and in church life. And so I think... First of all, I'd say that we can't um, overstate how much this already is an issue for the working classes. But yeah. also then, I think the way we start to break down barriers is actually just by becoming friends with people who are different to us. I, I think if you haven't got any friends who you might be embarrassed to take into uh, meet some of your other friends, then probably you need to get some different friends with different opinions to you to help, you know, the whole iron sharpens iron thing. Yeah. Because I've got friends who... Sometimes I'm just like, oh, I can tell what's about to come out of your mouth. Don't say it. Don't say it. You know, because of the setting, it will be like, yeah, maybe not as far as offensive, but it it might just wind people up or be like, oh, you can't say that. And I think that's really good to have different friends who have different opinions to us, who enrich our lives by the difference, even if we really strongly disagree, even if we think, gosh, you actually believe or think something that I find embarrassing, maybe. I think it does us good and I think it's part of sharpening us so I think firstly it's about who our friends are but I think also it's just open and honest conversations yeah. it's just asking people what do you find about Sunday mornings that you love or that you really really find hard to overcome what is it about prayer meetings that would make you come or not come what is it about small group life that makes you get involved or not get involved and the problem is when we ask those questions, we often don't want the real answer. We just, we want to be encouraged 
And if someone says something that doesn't encourage us, we get def- I mean, I do. I get defensive immediately. I feel that defensiveness rise up in me where I want to say, no, 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 but we do it this way because of this or because of that. Or no, you don't understand or what have you. But actually to be comfortable sitting with someone's critique of what we do and just just let it live with us for a week or two and just think, actually, have they got a point? And and also, I think challenge if you're in the majority in a church, and that might just be that you've been there 10 years. So you're in the majority because you've been there for such a long time. So you're one of the people who knows the traditions, knows the habits, knows how everything ticks. If you're one of those people, then I think just be humbly coming before the Lord and ask him, actually, how can I inconvenience myself for the comfort of others so that others might feel more comfortable in our setting? And it might be a little inconvenience for me to do something different, to sit with someone different, to have instant coffee instead of filters of coffee or whatever. Do you know what I mean? These are things where we we think they're such a big deal sometimes, but actually we can make these little inconvenient changes that for someone else are going to be the difference between them feeling totally uncomfortable or very, very relaxed in our church settings. So I think it's asking ourselves those questions, asking other people questions. I absolutely love that. How can we inconvenience ourselves to to be a comfort to to another and I think that's sits so much at the heart of the issue of of inclusion isn't it it's it's yes this might be the way stuff has always been done but a that doesn't necessarily mean it's the best way but also the best way is the way that the most people feel as comfortable um to come to Jesus as possible and um, with with the least amount of divides that's yeah. really helpful thank you and I guess one of my big questions as well is I see a lot of conflation between class and poverty and sometimes they're used the phrase class and poverty are kind of used in as as, as if they're one and the same and I know they're not but I'd love to um understand a little bit more about why they're not and how we can kind of um how we can best understand though those kind of particular to terms distinctively yeah sure well I mean I think working class traditionally has been much more about what sort of job you've got so whereas now I think we can sometimes demonize the working classes as assuming they're not working but obviously the clues in the name uh the working classes I think what makes this confusing is that many people who would identify as working class maybe aren't in the traditional blue collar jobs we would in the past have associated with it you know um it might have even been like industrial uh kind of work or those sorts of things which obviously isn't anywhere near as strong as it was even just 50 years ago and so i would still describe myself as working class but some people would say to me well you're not because i i went to university um first person in my family to go and i think my parents thought i was crazy um but I went because all the Christians around me were going and I was a new Christian. Um, and so I assumed that that's what Christians did. So that's quite funny because that's how I ended up going. Um, but I also six and a half years ago bought a flat. So I'm now on the property ladder. Um, mm. I do sometimes say though, what really, really made me middle class was during the lockdown in 2020, I bought an avocado for the first time and, um, <laughs> Yeah, I don't. I haven't repeated it since, so I don't know if that's firmly ensconced me in middle classness. But you know, there are certain outward trappings that yeah. people would say make me middle class, but I would still say I'm working class. And for me, that's all about values. It's all about how I think about things like food, for example. My question isn't, did I like it? It's, did I have enough? Now, of course, I will ask, did I like it too? But my primary question is one of actually quantity, not quality. And that's just one example um you know of just the way we think differently my values around money and possessions and you know like I really struggle with the fact that a lot of times in church when we talk about money we're either told to give or save but actually what we see in the bible is much more of an emphasis on just the giving and and living by faith yeah so I I you know I often ask people if you've got enough in the bank that you uh, never have to worry about something going wrong. You know, your car breaks down, but it's all right. You've just got money. You pay for it. Your um, your boiler breaks. Whatever your unexpected, if you've got all that money in the bank to pay for it, then you never have to live by faith. And in one sense, I sort of then feel a bit of sympathy because I'm a bit like, oh, you're missing out on the faith adventures that come when you don't 
have money in the bank. So there's yeah. all these different ways of um, kind of, I think, different things that we think about differently that are values to do with class. And poverty, of course, is about not having enough to get by. Mm. So a lot of people who are working class, are, they might have nice holidays. They might, um, I don't know, have, you know, kind of the stereotype is the big plasma TV and the going overseas for a beach holiday and things like that. Actually, there's plenty of people who are working class who earn a decent living, might even run their own business. I mean, there'd be loads of people who are running like plumbing businesses, building businesses, uh, electricians and so on. Um, whereas obviously people in poverty, that is about a lack. That yeah. is where you're missing something. And I think one of the problems with conflating these two is we assume that the working classes are lacking something. Well, the truth is the only thing they're lacking is Jesus. Um, and everyone who has doesn't know him is lacking him. So... And, and I think that's why sometimes we disciple people into middle class life, because we assume it's the best way and the right way. But actually, it's just a way of being a Christian. And so for me, that's where the danger comes in conflating the two, because it's the assumptions we make about people's lives, not quite living up to ours. Definitely. And I, and I think actually there are many people who have always been and would describe themselves as middle class, who in the last few years have experienced um, certainly a level of poverty that they've never experienced before um, you know you lose your job in lockdown and then we plunge into a cost of living crisis and all of a sudden it's yeah. not about you know what can we save um, or what can we you know it is about we just need to get food on the table we just need to make the thin ends thin ends meet um, yeah. and so I guess the challenge goes both ways in not assuming that all working class people um, are experiencing poverty, but equally acknowledging that actually not everyone who is, you know, middle class or might look um, middle yeah, class yeah, yeah. isn't experienced, but isn't experiencing poverty. And that it gets in yeah. scripture as well that poverty, blessed are the poor, encompasses so much more than our financial poverty as well. Absolutely. And, you know, James writes that um, the poor will be rich in faith. And yeah. we see that, don't we? So often, like I mentioned about faith adventures where the poor are rich in faith. But also one thing I find fascinating is that the people who are most likely to only pay the minimum off their credit card bill each month are the people who earn over £70,000 per year. I find that utterly astonishing because, you know, it, it shows this. And I mean, that's not even middle class. I don't know what that is. Over seventy grand a year is pretty high earning, isn't it? So. Yeah but they are the group of people most likely to only pay the minimum of their credit card each month and to not pay any extra or try and make any headway into it. Mm. And so I think we we can often think that middle classes aren't, you can be middle class and very much in poverty and you might be because you've got assets you can't access quickly. So we saw that, like you mentioned, lockdown 2020, people come into our food bank in Hastings saying, I've got a really nice house, I've got a really nice car. I just my whole business just collapsed overnight and I can't put food on the table because all my money's tied up in assets. Yeah. Um, and that's still a real kind of crunch point, a crisis point for people. But also there's the whole keeping up with the Joneses thing, isn't there? Where, you know, you can drive around certain nice areas and find that people don't even have curtains because they bust a gut to buy this nice house in this nice street. And now they've got no money left to even pay. Oh. The <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. It's definitely not black and white. No, I think I think that's really helpful and really important. And I guess moving on from kind of thinking about definitions and, and what this stuff means is, is the relationship between mental health and poverty. Because we know that um, struggles with mental health and mental illness are not you know don't particularly care, you know, mental illness doesn't isn't a respecter of persons, it doesn't care. Um what class you are um but I think there are some there are some particular concerns for people who are struggling with with poverty um and and with debt and things like that and and their mental health and I wondered if you could speak a little bit into into that yeah no I mean I absolutely agree it's interesting isn't it because you're right it's no respecter of um socioeconomic status or you know I I know people who in the last few years got everything they ever dreamed of in terms of jobs and relationships and actually their mental health has been worse since they got everything because it doesn't satisfy um mm. than it was beforehand so 
mental health, as you said, certainly isn't about what you've got, how much stuff you've got. But I think where for people in poverty in particular, living with the constant worry of can I put food on the table? Can I feed my kids? Can I provide everything they need? You know, new school uniforms. Like I've got friends who they're just like the fact that their kids grow is a genuine cause of anxiety and stress for them. And that it's the living with the pressure every single day of, you know, living hand to mouth. Can we make ends meet? Of reading headlines about the fact that your energy bills are going to keep going up and up and up, whatever. And you're going, I'm already struggling to pay the bills. It's living with the fact that you're in rent arrears and you you know that you're probably one step away from bailiffs at the door. And living with that constant pressure on you, it not just affects your mental health, it actually affects your physical health as well, because it means you, like, chances are you're not sleeping as well because of it. And if you're probably going without food so that your kids can eat. And so the physical side of it as well is very real. Um, you know, we all know about just kind of that the impact on the body of the stresses and strains and trauma that we carry and if you're in a constant state of worrying that you can't feed your kids or or yourself but I think more for those who are worrying about feeding their kids or you can't provide for your family in some way then actually the strain that puts on you across the board and and so then you find people starting to think well the kids would be better off without me I've failed as a parent and that's when you start getting into you know self-harm and thoughts of suicide and things like that and so the pressures are, are very very real and having a quite severe impact but then also I think the other side of it that compounds this is that access to healthcare varies wildly depending on where you live so if yeah. you are in a more deprived part of the UK then your access to a, to actually see a GP um to be diagnosed actually with something in a timely fashion that means you can get help before it spiral um the, and again this is both mental health and physical health actually so you've got the the fact that you're under more pressure you're under more strain so you're likely to be to be struggling you're more likely to be struggling with anxiety stress and then that leading into depression um and possibly even thoughts of suicide but then also the the care that's available to you is more limited and yeah. harder to access. So I think it's those two things together that mean that mental health um, among those who are struggling financially is um, is a pandemic actually yeah. right now. Even even the impact of the coronavirus pandemic hasn't gone away. I know that officially that pandemic's over, but the impact on people's mental health and and people's finances is still very much with us and. Something that the danger of saying the pandemic's over, as you know, kind of politicians and media have, have said, is that we then think, oh, we're all, all right, we're all, all right now, yeah. but we're not. And I think the danger as well is is the expectation for us all to go back to a normal that doesn't exist anymore. Yeah. Um, it's the expectation to go back to you know a job that doesn't exist anymore or um, a carefree way of living that doesn't exist anymore. Um, you know, I think, as you pointed out, you know, anyone who has children, the, the impact on them. And I think I think is really important that as the church, we don't rush what we should, I think, personally be in it now is is a period of, of almost like respite and recovery. Um, mm. But we've kind of skipped that because we want to do the new thing. Um, but I think respite and recovery is, and you know, that the term of convalescence in the in the particularly in the Victorian times where you'd go away to the sea and you'd kind of have time to to regain your strength and I think financially emotionally spiritually none of us have had that time to regain our strength no. but I think it's really important as we as we live in this post you know officially post pandemic world with the recognition as well I guess for those who who still are extremely clinically vulnerable who are still really scared every day yeah yeah absolutely yeah <laughs> so yeah nice easy answers to all of these questions obviously <laughs> and and I wonder so one of the things that we always um talk about in our training um particularly the mental health friendly church training is thinking about how can we provide um make sure that people can get access to mental health care. And so I always rec uh, recommend churches having um, 
a mental health fund that can either pay for or subsidize some counseling um, or mental health support where either the wait is so long that it would no longer be help particularly helpful or whether there's just there's just not the support available and actually perhaps the kind of help they need um, isn't available in the NHS. So I think that practically is one way that we can support people experiencing poverty. Um, but how else can we make our churches places that are ones that that kind of cross those divides um, um, other than, than, than what you mentioned before, but also that love the poor in a way that actually that's the wrong phrase um that, that don't see the poor as something other that yeah. it's part of our community it's in but how can we make sure our place churches are, are safe and supportive spaces for people living in poverty i think some of it is simply recognizing the stresses and strains that people are under and actually helping where we can so if you're someone in church life who is really comfortable financially at the minute and yeah you're noticing the cost of living crisis and there's a squeeze on you but actually you're still doing all right you can still afford to go out to a restaurant you can still think about holidays and that sort of stuff then just to be thinking who can i bless actually by easing some of their burden you know bible talks about us carrying each other's burdens bear each other's burdens doesn't it and so whose burdens can you help to carry that might alleviate just some of the pressure on their mental health with that you know you're not trying to help them with their mental health you're trying to help them with their practical needs but actually it will help with their mental health i think you're absolutely right about um having funds can you pay i mean even i would say if you're pretty well off could you pay for someone else's counseling if they if someone's telling you they need counseling and you know you've got the money to to help then then just help um i think also being really open about our own mental health struggles and I, that's obviously happening much more but still my Fear is that in the middle class churches in particular, we're not as open as we could be, that there's still shame and stigma associated mm. with saying that I'm struggling with real anxiety or whatever. So I always talk very openly about the fact that I've had counselling um, and quite a lot of it and have found it really, really helpful. In fact, I'd say it's probably the best money I've ever spent on anything in my whole life. Um, no, I would say that. Not probably. I would definitely say that. Um and I was in a privileged position in that I could afford it, but I could only afford it by not doing other things. Yeah. Um, and actually, when I finished, I at various points have contributed towards other people's counselling because I'd already set aside that money for myself. And then when I wasn't using it, I thought, well, actually, I can pay for someone else's who can't afford to. So I think there's that. But I think that openness of saying, we actually, we all struggle with mental health issues to varying degrees, of course. But who can you come alongside? I think obviously the way Kintsugi Hope helps with support groups and helps churches to be really on the front foot is is brilliant. And so thinking about how can we support someone in my church, we had one person and 12 of us supported her by each agreeing we would do one thing um, a week. And so she had real wraparound support, but it didn't become a burden on one person to do it. There are actually 12 of us who took little things, did little things to help. So I just think we need to get creative. We need to be open. We need to put our financial resources, if we've got them, into supporting people, but also just give people our time and be prepared to listen and not rush to answers, not rush to solutions, but just take the time to listen to people. And, and sometimes that's all people need, isn't it, actually, to know they've got a safe space to offload what's going on for them. Definitely. Yeah, I think that's I think that's so important. And I love that, that kind of wraparound care and, and not so often in churches our kind of idea of pastoral care is that there's a specific person who offers it but actually I I think I think I've said on the podcast before pastoral care is a team sport and actually if we all take a, a bit that is manageable for us it makes it much more sustainable and much more caring in the long run um, than one person trying to do kind of kind of all of it so I think that's that's such helpful wisdom um and before we go, is there, can you just tell us a little bit about kind of the mission of, of Jubilee Plus um, and perhaps how we can get involved? Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, so Jubilee Plus exists really to equip churches across the UK to be supporting people in poverty in their communities, to be changing the lives of people in poverty in their communities. And um, we do do some class stuff too, which is, you know, because of the book Invisible Divides and my background, but mostly we're focused on poverty in the UK and how we can help your church and your kind of Christian community 
to be making as big a difference as possible, but also really getting this in the DNA of the church. So it's not just a department of church life where some people are really enthusiastic about it. Because I believe that as disciples of Jesus, we should all be growing in mercy and compassion and generosity and kindness and all these things. So we help Christians and churches. We provide resources. We've got a conference um, in November called Churches That Change Communities. And I say we've got books and things like that. So, yeah, we can help you or your church to really push into all that God wants us to be doing in terms of bringing good news to the poorest in our in our communities where we actually live. Fab. Thank you so much. Um, and we will pop all the links to Natalie's books and to um, Jubilee Plus in the show notes. And thank you so much for joining us. And, and thank you so much for your for your wisdom, Natalie. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us at the Kintsugi Hope podcast. It's been great to have you with us. If you want to find out more about this amazing charity that creates safe and supportive spaces for those that are experiencing social isolation or poor mental health, then do check out the website kintsugihope.com. We'll see you on the next episode.